All right, yeah. Episode. Welcome to episode fifty-four of this goal, or episode number two. Well, it's fifty-four in the entire series, but episode number two of the Gold Cup podcast series with me, just me, again. <laughs> uh, this is the sequel to the Father's Day pod I did yesterday, or not yesterday. This is the sequel to the Father's Day pod I did a couple days later when we reacted. Uh, when we reacted to Mexico's Gold Cup game against Cuba. This time, they play a different opponent in North America. Actually, they play a team in the continent of North America. That team's Canada. So again, in this podcast, we're going to just go over the observations I made uh, against... I just We're going to go over the observations I saw during the Mexico-Canada game. Some of the things I like, some of the things I didn't like. Some pre-game like, thoughts and ideas. Uh, players that I thought stepped up. Players that I thought disappointed. What this means next for the Gold Cup. And other stuff like that so let's get started so just like any other match and just like the previous match i had i had some pre-game kind of thoughts and observations i kind of wanted to write down before this game started and i'm going to list them out as we go and then we'll see throughout the pod and as you've probably saw throughout the game what happened where these were were my thoughts and observations correct were my thoughts and observations wrong we'll see how this goes so one of the first ones i had was will tata rotate the squad I just wanted to see if he was going to go with continuity because uh, one of the things that I research, researched about Tata is once he, find his, uh, once he finds his ideal 11, he sticks with that 11. Um, to answer that question about will Tata rotate the squad, the answer was completely yes. <laughs> Tata basically just completely changed that midfield. Gone in the first game was Diego Reyes. I mean, he was still there, but he just moved to his natural position of center back. Gone was Andres Guardado. And gone was... Charlie Rodriguez. In came in Jonathan Dos Santos on the right uh, midfield. Uh, Eric Gutierrez. Or, sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Eric Gutierrez on the left side of the midfield. And Edson Alvarez tucking a center defensive mid role, even though he would eventually drop back to play. So, yeah. And then forwards, he pretty much kept the same lineup. Everybody else but that midfield. E- everything else in Mexico's lineup, excluding that midfield, basically changed. Again, I also had some questions for Canada and whether they could um, fulfill or answer some of the observations I had about their team. Um, again, the thing is, how could Canada exploit Mexico's high offensive fullbacks? That was something I noted in the previous pod that I wanted to make sure was highlighted going further along in this Gold Cup run. Again, Mexico may be very offensively talented, and that system and formation they use does provide a lot of attacking opportunities, but it often leaves them defensively fragile. Or not defensively fragile in that sense, but defensively exploited. Because they'll leave a lot of space behind those high pressing fullbacks. And there's space that just the center backs can't, just, they just can't occupy. Yes, they're split out a bit wide, but they're not split wide enough where they're essentially fullbacks. There's still a lot of room for someone who got into that space to just run. And I don't, I, probably a lot of people didn't know the Canadian national team, but they do have speedy players. And then one of the speedy players that I think I mentioned in the previous podcast was Bayern Munich uh, wonderkid Alfonso Davies. He could have exploited that defense. As you see through their game, and as I go through this podcast, we'll see if he could or couldn't. Again, another thing about Canada was whether the strikers Kyle Lahren and uh, Lucas Cavalini could prov- provide any pressure on Mexico's back three. Again, I bring back Alfonso Davies. Could he be the man? Could he step up and disrupt a lot of Mexico's defense and just kind of suck in defenders to attack him and let the other player, uh, let the other Canadian attackers flourish? Uh, as we go back to Mexico, I was wondering whether Eric Gutierrez could be that playmaking center mid, kind of like Andres Guardado, and whether he can lead the attacking line. I also wondering if him and Raúl Jiménez could have a combo play link up where Jiménez will drop in the back with Gutierrez and then Gutierrez would receive the pass back from um, he wouldn't receive the pass back but he received the pass forward like a dink pass for him to run off a, a Raul Jimenez pass. I wanted to know whether Raul Jimenez can score early and put this game away. I mean there's a lot to be said about Raul Jimenez. He is Mexico's main man. He is Mexico's main man. He's playing one of the hi- playing one of the highest questionable <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh that made me lose my train of thought but one of the best leagues in all the world and he had a great season there and considering chicharito isn't there he's expected to score a lot of goals and i want to see if he can get those jitters of just being that school score off of him 
And with the return of Edson Alvarez, I wanted to know whether he's fit enough to play the full 90. And if not, could, could somebody fill in that role? Whether it be Johnny Dos Santos, Eric Gutierrez, or maybe Diego Reyes coming in and moving forward in, in that position. And then I think, what is it? Two more questions. I wanted to know whether Uriel Antuna can continue to make an impact on the starting lineup. It was kind of surprising to see him play again. I mean, it was Cuba. I did, he was kind of a last minute like start because of the injury to Rodolfo Pizarro. But it seems like, it really seems like he's going to, uh, Tata's really going to go with Uriel Antuna until Rodolfo, uh, I guess, 100% healthy. And I want to see if he could provide more of that spark that he, that he provided against Cuba. Tougher, uh, Canada's definitely tougher opposition, so there's going to be a lot of question marks going to that. I wanted to know if the game was going to be close, whether like a one nothing or two one or two nothing, whether Mexico was going to make any tactical changes in their their game plan and way they're going to defend, or really the way they're going to attack. I think it was mostly the way they're going to defend because I mean, if they're up two nothing or up one nothing, I mean I'm assuming Canada's going to go bombing forward to try to get like an equalizer. So I wanted to see how Tata would shift the team around if he did it all. And then I guess one more question was, how was Canada going to play? I know this is a Mexico podcast, but I mean, I Canada's definitely Mexico's toughest test, I think, until the final or maybe the semifinal. Really, they have a, they have a good amount of MLS players and a good amount of players who play in decent leagues in Europe. So I thought they will be probably be one of the toughest tests. I wanted to know whether they were going to sit back and just kind of play on their counterattack or whether they were going to go all out and attack Mexico's high-pressing fullbacks and, you know, cause a lot of disruption there. We'll see that. So, game started. I can quickly read the, the lineups. We had the lineup of Raul Jimenez as the lone striker again with support with Roberto Alvarado on the left and Uriel Antuna on the right. Uh, Edson Alvarez was going to was gonna be in the center of the uh, CDM role with Eric Gutierrez, <laughs> too many E's, on the left center mid, and then again, Jonathan Dos Santos on the right center mid. Kind of, We're kind of both shifting towards the middle. And then again, we had Diego Reyes playing in his, as the right center back, and then Nesto Rujo, I guess, playing in that same position he played last game as the left center back. And again, the fullbacks run change, Jesus Gallardo on the left, and then Shaka Rodriguez on the right. And with Memo Cho, I guess, still playing that goalkeeping role. All right, game started. First thing, one of the first things I noticed was that Canada was playing with a back five. So to me, I was like, okay, this is gonna Mex- Canada is definitely going to sit back and try to hit Mexico on with the with the counter with the speedy players of Lucas Cavallini and Alfonso Davies. They really set up a huge block, set up a line, and said Mexico try to beat us because they really prevented Mexico from any ball movement. Okay? It was really the center backs and the wide fullback player just moving the ball around, trying to find anything in the middle or whether it be on the left or right flanks. But Canada was really good just just neutralizing, clogging any passing lanes and just preventing anything from happening going forward. Uh, I noticed that Canada was really trying to be physical. I mean, they definitely have the size over the Mexican players. I would say maybe the only physical player Mexico has on that team, maybe... It's an Alvarez. I mean, they're physical, but like they don't have the physical strength and just the size. Other than maybe Raul Jimenez, I think Mexico relies on their pace and their technical abilities to get through player teams. I noticed that whenever, anytime Mexico had the ball, Canada would immediately press. Not not essentially all the time. Only once they got into the midfield. I think Canada did this. So anytime a Mexican like midfielder or player in the mid. The midfield would lose the ball or turn over the ball. Canada could just pounce on them right away and then have numbers already ready to them on the counterattack. Um, again, within the first 10, 15 minutes, Canada just really held that line really well. I didn't think any, I didn't think any short passing movements or any short ball movements would get through Canada right away. So like some long diagonal passes to cut through Canada's like just wall of a defense just boop it over them would probably be some one way to kind of loosen up that wall our mexico really did well against the press canada did press them but nothing was lost everything was calm and composed for now or at this time i knew canada's game plan boot it boot it long and let's see what happens and set pieces because that's the only way canada was going to win so far they were not going to get through um, tiki-taka passing through Mexico's defense because 
I mean, Canada was set up pretty well, but I just, they just don't have that quality. No offense to Canada, but they don't have that technical quality that Mexico or possibly even the U.S. have. They just don't have it there, you know. Their best player is a pacey winger, but again, he doesn't have that passing ability yet to just boop, 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 and break defenses. Not there yet. Maybe in a couple of years, but not then. Again, 20 minutes, nothing going on. Antuna had been really quiet. There was, I think, a good shot by Raul Jimenez. I think one of the defenders had challenged him, and Raul Jimenez got a shot off. But again, it was a good shot But if it would have gone in, but nothing again. I think I'd noticed that they were, Mexico was starting to force it a bit too much. They were just, I think they were getting upset. They were getting frustrated with this wall that wouldn't let them breathe. They really neutralized, they really, really neutralized what Mex- what Mexico does really well under Tata. Use those attacking fullbacks. Like, I barely saw Jesus Guerrero go up and just go up. And if he did, it was really just stop, stunted, stop, stunted, stop, stunted. And on the right side, Shaka Rodriguez really didn't have any room to breathe. Every time he received the ball, there was at least two Canadian players to either A, block the passing lane, or B, block any, like, movement Shaka could produce by himself. I mean, I did see a couple times throughout the game that Shaka did do this, but very limited. Um, I guess 10 minutes later, or 4 minutes later, I wrote up my notes. Uh, it al- they <laughs> Canada almost had it with the booted and tooted long pass. It almost worked. I can't quite remember what happened now. But, yeah. Um, a couple minutes later, I think I was starting to notice. Where the heck is Eric Gutierrez, a PSV player? Where he at? He provided absolutely nothing, I think, in my opinion. And I think it's because Canada just stifled that midfield. They did played it really well just compo- compacted and composed they didn't allow jonathan dos santos or even eric Gutier- eric gutierrez to do anything so he was just isolated and he doesn't have that ability like andres Guardado has right now that like vision and skill to just you know i don't know was it weave himself in and out or just weave a pass to raul jimenez or to antuna or someone on the wings to just get past that defense um again same thing what i was noticing at the start of the game long diagonal passes is what's going to have to break up the canada defense um again there was that there was that spat between tata and the canada coach that was kind of funny to watch uh somebody commented on twitter <laughs> that that's mexican for real now um and again i think a couple of minutes later after that maybe five minutes we had the first and uh, we, we didn't have the first but we had another injury to this already depleted mexico squad and it was the man who just had been a ghost so far in this game, Eric Gutierrez. And it's a bummer. I did some research before this pod started, and it seems like he's going to be missing the rest of this Gold Cup. Um, it didn't look like he was entangled in some physical altercation with any of the Canadian players. It looks like he just ran, and it just like something buckled in his leg, and then he was done. And to me, and like my opinion, I've just been watching sports for like, I guess like six or seven years. That's like the worst injury to have, because you know. It's something in there, and it's going to be hard for anyone to find out what exactly it is. I mean, they'll find out what it is, but it'll be very hard for that, that muscle to heal properly. Or I was kind of upset that Eric Gutierrez had to come off injury. That was disappointing again. Mexico doesn't need another injured player. But I was happy to see Andres Guardado come in. Because Andre- Andres Guardado is definitely that general. He is what Mexico was missing at that point. That passing ability, that ability to just get in and out of defenses you know he was press resistant from what i've seen and he was really really what needed what mexico needed that leader to just go in and get that get a goal uh and they did uh <laughs> they and they did again it was a build-up play that came from the wings in the 39th minute a goal this time roberto Alvarado. again i think it was three people involved i don't quite remember who fed the ball to antuna and antuna crossed it from the right wings um, it was headed by Raul Jimenez, and then again, his header was blocked. No, was it headed? No, I think he he got the ball, he shot it, and then it bounced off weird. And then Roberto Alvarado was there just to boop, tap it in, and 1-0 Mexico. Really good pass. Took some pressure off Mexico, as I th- as I think, the I, I, I don't know what's going on with the crowd. I, I, I put the, the game without any audio, so maybe the crowd was starting to get frustrated. I definitely was starting to get frustrated about what was going on. But again, goal. Release a little bit of pressure. Great. And then I noticed that maybe... <laughs> this is something that kind of just popped in my head. Maybe Raul Jimenez should just miss as many shots as he... She should just take as many as shots as he can. Not miss, sorry. 
Raul Jimenez should take as many shots as he can. That's what came into my head. Because eventually, or a lot of the shots that he takes are at a, are at a close proximity, I think, in my opinion. And there will always be a bounce back. And there will always be some. there will always be somebody, in my case, or in my opinion, will probably be Uriel Antuna, who will just be there in the box to just tap it in. I think Mexico had a lot of those chances in the first game against Cuba. So I think I think Jimenez shouldn't let this gold drought, even though it's not a gold drought, but this like kinda sense of not scoring all the time get to his head. He should continue to shoot, 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 shoot. And eventually some of them will go in and the ones that don't go in, there's a good chance that somebody will be there to re- rebound it and just scoop it in for a goal. Uh, a couple minutes later I think Canada had their first chance their first really good chance of the game. Um, Luke, Lucas Cavallini kind of just swifted in and out against one of, I think, Diego Reyes. And he had a shot on target against uh, Ochoa, who had to make a save with both hands. And again, Lucas Cavallini got the rebound. He shot it, but I think the Nesta Rujo was there to just kind of poke it off. Last play of the game was a Rul Jimenez shot that was blocked by the goalkeeper. And that was the first half. A uh, frustrating first half. A uh, frustrating? Okay, sorry. A frustrating but very interesting first half. It was really nice to see a team make Mexico work. Not in the sense like I know Venez- the Venezuela and Ecuador game were really close, but I I, I didn't feel like me- they made Mexico work like mentally. Like we got to do this to get that, to get this, to get that. I think I feel like both of those games were back and forth, back and forth. We have the quality offensively. We have the quality offensively. Let's go at it. I think feel like the that's how those two pre-game or those warm-up games proceeded. But this time, Mexico really had to think, and Tata, the players on the field, really had to think, how do we break this team down? How are we going to do it? Do we play more? Do we just continue to go on the width? Do we play some more ball centrally? Do we play more with Ordado in the middle? It, it, it really got the juices going mentally. But as a fan, <laughs> I was pissed. I, did, I was upset with what was going on. I think I tweeted on our Tres Ways One Goal podcast account. If I can go back to the Google Images. Other than that goal, Canada's game plan has worked so far. Neutralize the fullbacks and play quick, direct counterattacks to the striker and Davies. Interested in what that that changed at halftime. That was my opinion of what, what was going to happen at halftime. I was just like, well, Canada has kind of... They were unlucky in that goal. They had played well enough to keep themselves in the game. So... It was kind of up to Tata to say, what are we going to do? I was, well, It was up to Tata. Yeah, it was up to Tata to say, what are we going to change? Those were just my thoughts going to there. So second half starts, again, keen on those first 15 minutes. As someone had told me, actually, it's Beat Your Foot. You should definitely check it out his YouTube channel and donate to his uh, Patreon. Very interesting guy. Very cool guy. Very analytical guy. If you don't, if he doesn't know Spanish, teach him. Or he doesn't know Spanish that well, teach him. He said he's down to learn. So second half c- commences. Um, again, had some pre, uh, had some like sec- pre second half uh, observation and thoughts. I wanted to know who would be the first non injury sub to come on for Mexico. Was it going to be Charlie Rodriguez? Was it going to be Oribe Pineda? And this was just kind of thinking like, what other player can Mexico bring on offensively? That can help them break down Canada. That was my thought. I was thinking, well, Mexico can't keep Canada. They can't keep it close because eventually Canada will just get a... Well, something will happen because that's just how soccer works. Anything happens. Canada will just get something lucky and will break through that defense and it'll just be goal, 1-1. So me- I thought Mexico needs to score a goal. They need to o- unlock them offensively and just put them away. I also noticed that kind of... Um, Coming back from um, a thing that Pietior showed me or told me in his master class was that you gotta have, you have to kind of notice how the coaches, um, when the game is going on, how the coaches tell their players what to do. Some coaches will allow creativity, freedom, will let the midfielders roam around, will just you know, you know, keep that general like formation and sense, but you know, inner switch. And some will just be, you stay here, you stay here, you stay here. So when we hit them on the counterattack, we can go boop, 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 and commence right away. And our defensively, we can do that too. So I was starting to notice that Tata is on the ladder of the coaches, the ones who stick to that formation. Because I think one time Mexico, I forgot when, but Mexico lost the ball. And as soon as Mexico lost the ball, 
everybody resorted back to their positions quickly, like like clockwork, like they were answered, something like that. Again, I digress. Um, so again, first 10, 15 minutes, nothing going on. And then in the 53rd minute, this is, again, Canada's probably most dangerous uh, opportunity. It was on off an Edson out of his bounce. And I think Davies ran with it or somebody passed it over to Davies again. And he moved. He was on the left. Uh, st- step back, I think. Somebody was cutting. Somebody was defending him. I forgot which player. And he shot it. And it bare- and it barely skimmed, barely skimmed by Memo Choa. And it was like literally like inches from going in. And I was thinking, well, oh, crap, oh, crap. I was like, oh, shit, oh, shit. <laughs> it was really, it was like crap like they're gonna score they're gonna score in mexico so i don't want to use us because i'm not part of the team but they're gonna score they're gonna score in mexico they're just gonna do it i need to hurry up because my laptop is about to die (laughs) they're gonna score and it's gonna be (laughs) but like a minute later all those doubts went away because mexico did what mexico does best and they just shut them up (laughs) (laughs) sorry i'm trying to relax i'm also recording in a car uh, my laptop's on nine percent. We'll see how this sounds. Good enough, right? Also, there's barely any gas in my in my <laughs> in my car because I had put the first ten to fifteen, actually like twenty minutes, with the AC, and like I have enough to get to the gas station that's next to my house. I digress. So golazo, 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 but or gol by <laughs> Andres Guardado, Guardado, <laughs> Andres finger, Andres Guardado, and again uh great what is it i forgot how i don't even remember how they scored let me look at my notes oh it was a good pressure from raul jimenez on one of the canadian center backs the one of the canadian center backs lost the ball and just picked it up kind of did a move or two and then just boop in the left no the right corner out the over the outstretched arm of borjan or whatever the canadian goalkeeper name is and it was just magical it was magical it was a mexico it was a mexico moment whenever you think like damn we really messed this sorry damn when mexico messed this is up they just they uh, score on score on you and make make you believe again like they always do only for it only for them to disappoint you at a later stage not right now but again this was the goal that mexico really needed it really relieved a lot of pressure for the next like 10 minutes um, I noticed that Canada wasn't blocking as wide. They were kind of just, they were kind of focused on the central because they saw that Andres Guardado provided so much in that in that midfield. He did what Eric Gutierrez and Jonathan Dos Santos couldn't do as a pair. Um, I mean, Dos Santos, uh, Dos Santos reverted just as like kind of that, uh, like pest pest would run around and try to uh, get the ball from any of the Canadian players, but on the, Andres Guardado just focused offensively and he was just, he unlocked that because he just had the technical ability to pass through Canada's defense and just move around Canada's, Canada's defense. And after that, the wide the wide areas got a little more freed up. And every time uh, Shaka or Jesus Guardado would kind of go into the middle, that would kind of cause Canada's wall to go a little, you know, unsettle a bit. But again, Mexico couldn't do anything about that. And then I think the 55th minute, 56th minute, so we first started having our first set of subs for Canada. The first one was Kyle Laren for Jonathan David. I wanted to see, I wrote down a note to see what could uh, Jonathan David bring. He plays over in Europe for Ghent, I believe. Not 100% sure, but he does play in Europe. Uh, noted that Raul Jimenez had been a little quiet. He had, a fi- he had his header blocked in the 58th minute. It was a good, good, good header. Uh, again, we had another uh, Canadian sub like four minutes later. We had number seven come off for Jonathan Osorio. And Jonathan Osorio plays for Toronto FC. I remember, I don't remember, I don't know if he was injured last year, but he I think he had a quiet season last year when Toronto FC was disappointing in MLS. But I remember when he played, when Toronto FC had all those players, Altador, um, Jovinko, him, that Spanish midfielder, Bradley, and they like made it all the way to the, Champions League finals of CONCACAF on those two a really bad crappy Chivas teams but he was very instrumental in that and I never thought he was afraid to get a lot of the Mexican or like Mexi- Liga Mex players he was just very confident in what he was doing so I thought that was a really good sub 
Uh, number five came out for number eight. I didn't. I just didn't know those players, so I just wrote down their numbers. Um, I kind of was interested. Maybe maybe the Canadian coach put them on as fresher legs to press more. I guess five minutes go on, and this is the first time that we saw Canada kind of kind of dominate a little bit of the little bit of the game. So this is where Canada played a little more direct, a little more offensively. Uh, I think one of the first instances was this dangerous Jonathan Osorio shot in the 64th minute. He w- he started in the wide area, received it, he kind of cut back inside and unleashed the shot, and I th- it went over the bar, but it caused enough thought in in Memochoa for him to raise up and try to get the ball. It was pretty close. A couple, f- like a, if it was a little bit wider and a little lower, it could have it could have gone in. Just saying, but again, that didn't happen. And a couple of minutes later, Canada countered really well. They had a numerical advantage of three on two. It was, I think, um, where is it, the striker? Cavini, Osorio on the left, and then I think Jonathan David or somebody else on the right. Can't confirm it's Jonathan David. And they had it three on two. And I think one of the center backs from Mexico, or I can't quite remember either because it happened really quickly. I kind of took my, uh, my mind and just kind of went to fan mode. <laughs> but he, the Canadian right winger, or just messed up the ball he did something he slipped on the ball or just something happened and mexico is very lucky to just escape out of that nothing again uh 68 minute we had the first non-injury sub from we had the first non-injury sub for mexico this time it was robert alvarado coming out and luis montes leaving i was just kind of puzzling why tata brought on luis montes maybe for defense defensive stability but again didn't do the research bad on me and then we had another sub five minutes later. Jonathan Dos Santos coming off and Charlie Rodriguez coming on. And I was kind of happy he brought him on. You know, Jonathan Dos Santos had really done nothing up to this point. And Charlie Rodriguez was kind of was kind of all right offensively against Cuba. So I was kind of interested in what he was going to bring to this game. And then a couple of minutes later, Canada finally, finally succeeded in their goal. <laughs> they finally got the goal they wanted. And they kind of deserved for a little bit. Um, again, it was a mistake by Nesta Rujo. Jonathan De- David took the ball away from him, and then it was it was two on one. Jonathan David kind of lost his grip a bit, but he was stable enough to pass it over to Cavallini, and for him just slotted it in a goal in two one Mexico. And at this point, Canada really had the momentum. They had style Mexico's progression of the ball just past midfield for most of for like a good ten to fifteen mid period. Canada looked like they were gonna get a point out of this result and it was really interesting i was like thinking oh crap <laughs> canada's gonna do it canada's gonna take some points off mexico everybody's gonna just panic and blah so but before all that happened again and the world came crumbling down in televisa having a <laughs> ready to fire tata uh another goal by the man who rescued mexico again andres guardado on the 76th 77th minute Again, it was a really good uh, long pass. It was great body movement and great hustle from Uriel Antuna to just rustle that ball out of the out of uh, the, those two Canadian defenders, and for him to to just go at the goalie, but then to stop and then pass it over at Guardado, who again at that moment was free. He did one shift, caused the defender to go one way, and he had an open shot and almost missed it, almost missed it, but did not and score he did. To make it 3-1 Mexico. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't say that. More, I'm, I'm, I'm more reserved. But again, <laughs> he did that. It was great. Really good. And after that, I think Mexico just kind of wasted their time. They, they essentially did waste the time to get to get that W. Um, another kind of injury concern that happened. In the 80th minute, Chaco Rodriguez came off. And again, I couldn't quite uh, understand what was going on with this injury. Um, I think Jonathan Osorio had come come at him, or they bumped into him, or pushed him down, and Mexico was playing without was playing only with ten men for like the longest time, for, not the longest time. Mexico was playing with ten men for about like six or seven minutes, and it was and Canada just kept playing on. So, yeah, they they did it. Eighty uh, seventh minute comes back, but not before another dangerous um, Canada shot. And I think again it was by Osorio. And again, it, I think this time it required Memo Choa to save it, but I don't quite remember it. Um, after that, Mexico was just wasting time. And then a couple minutes later, the game was over, and Mexico walked away with three points. 
and secure passage to the next round. I think they have to win or at least tie the next next game and they'll go top of the group. And here came in my observations of what was going on. Okay, so I'm back now. So where we left off was I was going to make some observations about the expected goal. And what the expected goal is, it's just some useful tool in um, kind of decoding the game. Oftentimes you'll see like a lot of people say passing or how much percentage you had or how many shots in the game will often tell you who dominated the game. But that's not necessarily true. Oftentimes a team will just take one or two, two or three shots and they can be lethal. But sometimes often a team will take 10 or 15 shots have a lot of possession but they could be worth nothing that's because like maybe the first team scored right away and they just decided to sit back so let's see so i obviously <laughs> so something i'd probably notice was canada i probably thought canada's xg their expected goal um number was probably higher in the second half actually it was probably higher throughout probably higher um throughout the game as i thought and their xg probably in the second half was like ridiculous ridiculously crazy after they brought us brought on osorio and jonathan osorio and jonathan david it probably went up more and i thought they were the more dangerous team as the game whittled on but here are my overall impressions of the game were just like prop just my overall impressions of the game on each side even though this is the mexico podcast but i'm only doing canada is because they just played really well really really well i thought they deserved a little bit more than what they got a 3-1 uh victory seems kind of I think it papers over the Mexico cracks, but I mean, they played pretty well. They followed their game plan and what their coach had probably coached them throughout that, throughout the days leading up to the, um, to the game was play a good, solid defensive game, block out any passing lanes or any lanes in the wide areas, clog that middle lane so nothing can go happen there. So Mexico couldn't beat you with their quality or make Mexico beat you with their mentality with these long passes. And if they do happen to do any long passes, well, Canada has the center backs to just kind of physically push Mexico out. <laughs> That's what they had. Um, again, I thought they were really unlucky in some of those shots. I think one of them was Osorio. And then the other one was the Alfonso Davy one right before um, Ochoa. Or not, right before Guardado scored. That was literally inches off from being a goal and making it 1-1. And at 1-1, it could have been a complete... It obviously would have been a completely different game than at 2-0. Um... Probably if you're Canadian, you probably want to see your coach start. Jonathan Osorio, Jonathan David, uh, Lucas Cavallini or Cavillani. I've been butchering his name throughout this entire podcast, so I don't care. <laughs> and Anthony, and Anthony, <laughs> Anthony Davis. Shout out Laker fans, and uh, those players really should start for Canada. And if the defense could show up a bit more, I think they could really make a run to the final. And this again could be the final come july 9th or whatever the gold cup happens in chicago it could be mexico versus canada and if that happens that honestly wouldn't surprise me i think canada really make made a stake for top five in Concacaf. again that isn't very hard but i mean i think top five would get you in the world cup <laughs> so again now let's go to the team that we focus on a lot since this is a mexico podcast Mexico wasn't convincing. They couldn't break down that Canada wall multiple times. They were sometimes lucky to get those goals, but, I mean, Mexico technically was going to break them down. They have the ability technically to break them down. So that was going to happen eventually, but, Mex I mean, Mexico was really stymied about that wall. Nothing going on the flanks and nothing on the ce centrally. I mean, okay, Jesus Gallardo, I saw nothing of him, and then... Shaka Rodriguez, I mean, had some time here and there where we would kind of dance dance off of them, but, I mean, really just provided nothing. Or he would dance off off of them, but, again, he was really isolated for much of the game. I also thought, even though Guardado did come to the game, even though even though Guardado did come and play, I thought they were too reliant on Andres Guardado. I mean, if he gets injured or if something happens, Mexico really has nothing centrally to look forward to. I mean, maybe start Charlie Rodriguez next team and see what he offers, but I think this team is a little bit reliant on Andres Guardado. Um, again, Raul Jimenez, no goals. Yeah, the pressure is going to start to mount on him again and whether he can score goals. But, I mean, I think he should just continue to shoot. If they go in, they go in. But I think it's very good that he's shooting a lot because somebody will be there to just rebound it in and score. Um, the Eric Gutierrez injury, again, as I mentioned early in the pod, he's going to be out for possibly the entire tournament. And that might be the last time we, or the, that might be the last time 
anybody sees them until like the, I guess the CONCACAF Nation League stuff but again that's another battery Mexico can't afford to lose and then thing that does going to be really having to spin the wheels and then this kind of goes back to answer my my pre-observation or my pre-match observations which we'll, which we'll get back to um Etienne Alvarez was okay he seemed okay fit wise he wasn't the best just return sometimes subpar he kind of was rescued that um Canada didn't score in that three to two advantage because there could have been some damage there um, again, Canada did exploit um, Mexico's really high pressing fullbacks with just tons of space. Oftentimes, it was really oftentimes just like <laughs> it was oftentimes it's an Alvarez, not even it's an Alvarez sometimes because he pushed a little too high. But it was uh, Nesta Rujo and Diego Riacha trying to contain Alfonso Davies and whoever. And they really did have ample space to run at them. But again, the, they just didn't have the ability technically to just score a goal or anything. But, I mean, Mexico would also counter really well. I noticed sometimes when, like, Canada would just have the momentum going forward, pushing numbers up, and then something happened. I wish I could snap my fingers, but I don't know how to snap my fingers. But Mexico is really good at count- a really good counter-attacking team with a Stata team. It would be interesting to see what they do moving forward, probably against whoever they play in the, the semifinals or finals. Uh, I noticed Tata's live and die by that formation that four or that yeah four three four or no four three three because that would be four plus three seven yeah I'm dumb yeah that four three three just he's gonna live and die with that formation I didn't really see anything change tactically even defensively but uh whatever Uriel Antuna was okay I noticed he played a he didn't have that like face value performance that everybody saw against Cuba when he had those three goals and an assist but he was he was okay he got in a good position I think he crossed in that ball to score the first goal he showed enough hustle and wit and just a little bit of skill to get uh, Andres Guardado in a good position for Andres Guardado to finish off the game that time so I want to go back to my kind of thoughts my pregame thoughts we'll answer these very rapidly will Tata rotate the squad yes he did how can Canada exploit Mexico's high offensive line just just booted and, booted and counterattack quick boots and quick counterattacks can they exploit mexico's high defensive line uh just for one goal but and again that was a defensive mistake but they'll learn from this i think they can be a d- bit dangerous can kyle laird and Cav- lucas cavallini provide more pressure on mexico's back three um laird not really cavallini a bit a bit more he's a little bit more physical he does play for in the Liga MX with Puebla, I think, or Pachuca. Can't quite remember. Uh, so it was kind of like 50-50, but when they brought on Jonathan David, a bit more, yes. Can Alfonso Davies be the man? He can, but not yet. I think he's a little too young. Maybe give it another Gold Cup cycle. Jonathan Osorio can be, though. That man was on fire. Can Eric Gutierrez be that playmaking center mid to lead the line and attack? No. And can he combine with Raul Jimenez? No. Can Raul Jimenez score early and put this game away? Double no, but he did help with that miss. <laughs> um, how fit is Edson Alvarez? Can he play? Um, I would say he's kind of play. And he played okay, and he played the entire game. And can Antuna continue to make an impact on the starting lineup? I think at halftime, I I noted that he I need to see a bit more of him. It was kind of it was Mex Canada had signed Mexico pretty well, so I just need to sit, see a bit more. And then the second half, other than that. I guess second one of the goal didn't really provide too much. So question mark a bit more. Again, another question mark. But I think I'd rather see him in the starting lineup or Rodolfo Pizarro at this moment. I, I, I would bring him on. I would bring Rodolfo Pizarro on as a sub moving forward in this tournament. I think Antunica brings enough quality. Uh, we'll skip over that one. And then that was really it upon this. Um, let's go back to my quick outline. Uh, some players that stood out for me. We'll do this quickly. Okay, so players that stood out. Um, I, and that's why that was really the only player that really stood out. Everybody else was kind of just left puzzled and stymed. I've said stymed a lot. I need to use another word for stymed. I'll figure it. I'll guess blockaded. Suffocated is another good word. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's what those stood out. He was definitely the MVP, man of the match, whatever you like to call it. Mejor, whatever unlock canada a bit 
more than Eric Gutierrez did and then just provided those two key goals to get them over the top. Players that didn't reach any expectations. Uh, I, I want to say Jonathan Dos Santos. I, I would have gone with Eric Gutierrez had he stayed the entire game, continued to perform the way he was performing. But Jonathan Dos Santos, I really didn't think provided anything. I didn't see him other than being like a little bit of a pest on the Canadian attackers. Nothing. Nothing really. So I thought that was kind of disappointing. Um, that's that's really it. Maybe a N- Nestor Rujo for making that costly mistake. But other than that, so the one thing that, that stood out to me is Tata is stuck to that three no four three three formation. He's going to live and die by that formation. And I think Mexico will get through the Gold Cup just fine. But again, Canada... Canada may have one of the stronger attacking lineups in this tournament, but let's say they play Jamaica or maybe Costa Rica who have a bit more technical ability other than just paste. They could cause some problems for Mexico's defensive line. So we'll we'll leave that as a question mark. Um, what's next? Mexico is going to play Martinique on Sunday night. Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. The only reason I know that is because A, I Googled it. A, I almost bought tickets to it. I didn't because I'm going to go to see Arsenal. So that'd be a little bit more interesting. But it's just competitive stretching, really. That's what the preseason is. Um, something I think some things you should consider or thought I should consider is maybe maybe one more rotation. Maybe have Charlie Rodriguez playing that center mid role again next to Guardado, maybe? Maybe Los Santos run around, get everybody tangled up. Let Atten Alvarez get back to um, match fitness. And I think you stick with Alvarado and Antuna. And maybe bring on Rodolfo Pizarro if he's, if he's healthy, but as a sub. to see what he provides. And then, yeah... Those are my final thoughts. And I think enough has been said. I think enough has, I think too much has been said. <laughs> um, yeah, you, I think this is the end of this pod, this short but very long podcast. Uh, you know where to catch us. We're on any streaming or we're not streaming platform. Actually, you can. If you have any, like any like one of those like streaming devices, you can catch us there. So we are streaming. But you can catch us on like any pod- podcast platforms you can possibly think of. Except for iTunes. No. We're on iTunes, of course, but except for iHeartRadio and Pandora, but it's okay. Only old people use that. Just kidding. I'm going to cut that out, <laughs> but it's okay. We'll eventually get that on there. And we're on YouTube as well. You know, follow our social medias. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And yeah, I think the next pod will be Monday and it'll be with everybody again, not just me. Is We're going to recap the go- uh, We're gonna recap the group stages. We're going to look forward to the... I guess the knockout tournament now, whether it's going to be the quarterfinal, semifinals, and hopefully final for Mexico. And yeah, that's it. Bye. Good night. Peace. Shout out Zion.